clicking with that. Uh, recording. Got it. Yeah, because I want to share this with a couple of people who didn't show up, Sandy. Well, you might not want to share all of this, but but yeah, you're in charge. So there you go. Well, I wouldn't <laughs> ever say that about me. Ask Mary <laughs> and Valerie. Having a healthy brain. Well, what's the big deal about a healthy brain? I, I think we're all uh, on the same page with it is very important to have a healthy brain because your brain is actually in charge of everything. The movement of your body and everything you are and have been and remember and aspire to has to do with your brain. And it's not, you're not the big giant head. I mean, the brain doesn't do anything unless your body is involved. And um, so it has to be able to communicate. But the brain and having a healthy brain is very important because cognitive decline is the number one health concern worldwide. Now, it used to be cancer and heart disease, but now, and especially with COVID, and what we've been through for the last three years, it is hugely concerning. And, um, you know, in, in um, how we deal with our populations um, coming off of COVID or how we deal with our populations and not being our usual running around town selves, having to wear a mask, having to do this, having to do that. Um, and also because um, we just don't have the communications with each other that we used to, but it is a worldwide concern. And in terms of your brain, just a few facts. You need to, you need to know how it operates. It weighs about three pounds. Your skull weighs a lot. So your, the total weight of your cabeza is uh, about uh, 10 to 12 pounds. It uses 25% of your body's energy. So it needs fuel. It needs to um, have fuel to do its job. And it's always on. It is always on. It's not like, I'm going to pull the plug. We say, well, we unplug. Well, we don't really unplug. <laughs> our brain is always on. And it's, it's using our, our energy. We have to give it fuel. And it um, needs good sources of fuel. Just as a matter of fact, these are big numbers. 87 billion neurons in your brain, give or take a couple. And neurons are brain cells. And we are constantly, hopefully, producing new brain cells. You don't produce new brain cells when you're sedentary, when you're um, stressed, you're, you're not, and when you're not physically active. Um, even after you're dead, you produce brain cells for a little bit, by the way. But 87 billion neurons, one quadrillion connections. So those neurons come together and create connections or what we call neural pathways so that neurons that fire together, this is a saying, you've heard this before, neurons that fire together, wire together. And those neural pathways are like super highways for everything that we're about. What we think, what we feel, what we see, um, how we behave, uh, everything about us. So what, boosting your brain power is essential. Um, you may not think so, because some people say, well, it's too late for me. It's never too late to begin. And there's a lot of research being done. I mean, I have I went down the rabbit hole with research um, that's being done. And, and just in the last 10 years, so much is being done about how we can boost our brain power, how we can maintain cognitive uh, ability over the course of a lifetime so that we don't have a long body life and a short brain life. That doesn't work well. So better communications with the rest of your body. The job of the brain is to control the activities and movement of the body. That's the job of the brain. 
And so we want to have really good neural pathways or communications, those synapses. Um, improved ability to respond, react, and recover. And you've heard me talk in ageless grace because the whole basis of ageless grace is improving our ability to respond, react, and recover. We have tools for that, but it's everything about us, responding, reacting, and recovering. It enables us to ward off bad stress, anxiety, and depression, which can take our life away, which are, make us ready targets for Alzheimer's and other dem dementias. And so boosting your brain power can help prevent, can help prevent or slow down the progression of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. And that we're doing, having a lot of research um, being done in those areas. So lifestyle medicine, let's call it that, because sometimes we think, oh, it's just too much. There's too much. I can't do it all. I can't change my diet. I can't blah, 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 blah. That is copping out. So just take it a little bit at the time. A sharper brain might just be at the end of your fork. In other words, we're talking about nutrition. Not diet, but nutrition, fuel. Move it. We're talking about movement. I could call it exercise, but you know, I don't like that word because it makes you think you have to be in a class and you have to do this and do that. Every single movement counts. And the more you engage in movement activity, physical activity, getting up out of the chair is one thing. <laughs> Walking across the room instead of using the remote. Yeah, that is movement and that counts. So all movement counts. Don't skip disease. Sleep is important. Um, restorative sleep, not just a nap in the afternoon. You can't catch up, by the way. If you miss sleep, you can't take a nap and catch up. And the other thing that's extremely important is what's your why? What is your purpose? A purpose-driven life. So diet, exercise, sleep, and cognitive engagement. These are lifestyle factors. And that's our best bet for reducing dementia risks. It's a very simple formula, a simple prescription for optimal brain health. So here's a plan that a couple of doctors came up with that are engaged in the community. And I have a link to a uh, a, a video that they did, a PowerPoint presentation <laughs> that they did, but their plan they call the neuro plan. I like the term neuro because it has to do with neuroplasticity, neurons. And so they use this as an acronym, which may help you remember nutrition, exercise, I call it movement, unwind, reducing stress, and restorative sleep and optimizing mental and social engagement. So Dr. Aisha and Dean Shirazai were on a talk with the Brain Health Center, um, the University of Texas in Dallas, just this past week. And so I was like, oh my God, I've got to have that. I need that because this is important. And it's a very, very simple, uh, comprehensive, not uh, research, well, it is research driven, but it's not, you know, the scholarly over your head. It's stuff you can do. So you might want to check that link on my bibliography. Nutrition. All right. That is nutrition creates our internal environment. We want to talk about dietary patterns, not a diet, but dietary patterns. And there are a couple of them that are touted, that are really good. We've all heard of the Mediterranean diet. Um, and this is the diet pyramid for the Mediterranean diet. There's the DASH diet um, and the MIND diet. The MIND diet um, is sort of the combination of the Mediterranean diet and the DASH, D-A-S-H diet. And you may have heard of that. The, the M-I-N-D is an acronym. 
and what is on the mind diet um here are the things pastries and sweets way down there less than five times a week things that you can do yeah at least three servings of whole grains each day maybe oatmeal at least one dark green salad and one other vegetable each day berries at least twice a week nuts walnuts almonds beans or or legumes every other day poultry and fish those are good sources of protein um, and a five ounce glass of red wine each day not so bad um, if you don't drink alcohol purple grape juice uh, has some of the same benefits um, as wine and uh, you know, you, you don't use alcohol. So we want flavonoids and those kinds of things in our diet. This is a great time of year to tap into this nutrition factor because summer vegetables, leafy green vegetables, berries, the farmer's markets, if you just throw into your scrambled eggs, um, a handful of uh, spinach then, or create a salad for your lunch or dinner and leafy green fresh vegetables um, are plentiful right now. So take advantage of the farmer's market. You may run, I always run into John Burns when I go to the Tucker's farmer's market, which I'm going to do this afternoon and get some peaches and get some, I got beets and turnips last time. And I don't usually get those in the cans because there's a lot of sodium and I like the fresh vegetables roasted. So there are lots of ways to prepare. You don't have to change your whole diet. You don't have to do everything, just a little bit at the time. So the MIND diet, and here's, here's the um, summary from Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. Um, the study reports that the MIND diet may help reduce a person's risk of developing Alzheimer's disease and help maintain cognition in older adults. So their findings are really, really important because um, it's never too late to start. You can start now. It's like, I'm old, I can't change. I, it's not going to help my brain. Well, the MIND diet High scores uh, were associated, high scores of the MIND diet in this group of, of people that they tested and worked with for a while. And it's a great diet. It's, it's delicious. Um, we're associated with better memory and thinking skills, independent of Alzheimer's. These are not people that had an Alzheimer's um, pathology on the horizon. But um, independent of that, they had much better memory and thinking skills. Um, and so the diet, they say, seemed to have a protective capacity, protective capacity. I think that's an important word, a protective capacity, and may contribute to cognitive resilience in the elderly. Well, we, we be the elderly, <laughs> no matter how you put it, that's us. And for anybody, but especially um, cognitive resilience. We hear a lot about resilience. I just read a story uh, online about a, a graduate of um, Italy who uh, has done a research paper on creativity in um, fostering resilience in older adults and empowerment and um, those are important things, creativity. All right, so I had 1,000 patients aged 58 to 98. With, the ones with strict adherence to the diet resulted in 53% reduction in risk of Alzheimer's. That was a strict, moderate adherence resulted in 35% risk reduction. Well, good grief, 35%, that's a pretty good deal. And that's moderate adherence. That's something you can do, you know, every day in a simple uh, change in what you're eating. And participants who showed high adherence to the diet had cognitive functioning 
equal to a person seven and a half years younger. That means that my cognitive functioning would be equal to, oh, Victoria's. <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Seven and a half years younger brain. That's not a bad deal. So here's your platter. Unprocessed plant forward food, mono and polyunsaturated fats, plant proteins from lentils, beans, and, and soy products. Um, complex carbohydrates. Increase your fiber and extra virgin olive oil as your cooking oil. So you don't have to do all of these, but if you do a couple of them, you'll be in a much better stead. And if you get in the habit of it, remember when we talk about neuroplasticity in Ageless Grace, we talk about habits. This is a healthy habit and one that will um, increase your cognitive longevity as much as your, your physical body longevity. Because if your brain's gone, it's not going to do you much good. So next one is movement, my favorite, also known as exercise. And it is the basis of neuroplasticity, which is the big mama jama of cognitive, um, useful, optimal functioning uh, of the brain. The BDNF protein, which is brain derived neurotropic factor, just call it BDNF. It is responsible for neuroplasticity. If it's not in existence, then those brain cells are not born and they can't wire together and fire together. So you've got to have movement. And I don't mean moving a scrabble thing across the board or turning a card on the card table. I mean increasing your physical activity to, you might break a sweat. Oh my goodness. Well, that's not too hard these days. <laughs> I could break a sweat just walking across the room, it's so hot. But it also increases your blood supply and the blood supply to your brain because your brain has to have oxygen. It reduces insulin resistance, which means better brain cell metabolism. It also reduces depression, anxiety, and attention deficits, which can lead to neurodegenerative and um, you know dementia. Those things can. Reduces the prevalence of vascular and neurodegenerative disease. So movement um, and, and keeping it regular and physically active is important. Your brain has to be engaged to do physical movement. That's the job of the brain, to manage the body. So break a sweat, yes, get a little, oh, I'm tired, I, I have to stop now. We'll go a little bit more, optimize. You don't have to you know, kill yourself, but do a little bit more, do two more. Two more is gonna make a huge difference, like two more helpings of greens in your salad is gonna make a huge difference. Two more um, uh, squats is gonna make a huge difference. Cardio three or four times a week, and that could be dance, which is a great spatial relationship, remembering, figuring things out, um, and being with other people. Strength two times a week, and that's resistance training. It does not have to be lifting weights. It can be lifting your body off a chair. Just think about that. And it has to be regular, moderate to strenuous, and that's what grows the brain. Regular, consistent, regimented, continuous, keep going, not just in that class one day a week. 10 minutes a day every day, that's what we say in Ageless Grace, 10 minutes a day. That is a great start, a little bit at the time. 10 minutes, three moves, make it up, and then you can go to class. And that class is going to be once a week. Well, once a week's not going to do it. So regular, moderate to strenuous, and you can break a sweat in Ageless Grace. I know some of you don't, but um, I do. And, and I try to go 
a little bit beyond so you don't just sit there and look at me. I'm not the entertainment. <laughs> Let me go back to that. Um, leg strength is important. Leg strength means a bigger brain. I just spoke in strength and balance about the fact that your thigh muscles and your butt muscles are the biggest muscles of your body. They require more of, uh, of you, of your brain. So strengthening those muscles means more of that BDNF protein is going to be called on and more brain cells are going to be created to improve your leg strength. It's also going to help your balance and uh, your posture because that's your base. But those are your large muscle groups. And that means a bigger, healthier brain when you strengthen those. And be sure that it's regimented and continuous in doses. Have you ever refer, heard anybody refer to exercise as how many doses? Well, I read in my down the rabbit hole, they refer to it as doses. It's a dose, like taking a pill. Well. Those doses of movement are needed for neuroplasticity. And they've done a study to determine how many doses before it becomes a habit and your brain and your body don't have to be engaged so much. 12 to 14 doses. And then you have to do something different. So, you know, in Ageless Grace, how I'm always changing it up. I mean, I know you think this is silly stuff we do in Ageless Grace, but it is brain science. At a, at a very fun, joyful level. So every day for a week, 10 to 15 minutes a day is going to serve you well for your brain and your body and neuroplasticity. Consider it a dose of medicine. All right, stress. We have good stress and we have bad stress. And good stress is the kind that, um, uh, maintains our survival. It boosts new, it surprises. The brain loves novelty. And it, it loves to be surprised and figure things out. That's analytical thinking and um, uh, strategic planning, not doing the same old, same old. So that boosts new cell production. Good stress sharpens memory because you have to remember that the hairy mammoth chased you last time and almost got, took you out. Your memory has to be called on, your brain is being called on, and your hippocampus. It also speeds learning. Now you learn that, you know it. And then um, it creates brain resilience because it's created learning. Your brain is more resilient, so is your body if that big hairy mammoth is chasing you. You're very resilient because you can get the heck out of the way. But those are the positives of stress. Stress can be good. Dr. Wendy Suzuki has talked a lot about that. And there's some little tests that she has that you can take um, that are on the link I'll give you. Bad stress is the kind where you engage in negative self-talk, just negativity in general, um, down, down on yourself. That damage the cell, damages the cells in the hippocampus. That's the big important part of your brain. It impairs learning. It gets in the way of learning. And you lose motivation and energy. Oh, I don't feel like it. I'm not, I just don't feel motivated. But a lot of that can come from stress and it can take you out. And it also physically damages the brain's blood vessels. Yes. So you're not getting oxygen in your brain. You know, the brain has to have oxygen and blood is oxygen. So good stress, bad stress. Restorative sleep. Well, that, that's, not, that's, not, that's restful, restorative. The brain has to be cleaned up. There's a little janitorial service that comes in when you get to a certain level of REM sleep. And that little janitorial service comes into your brain and cleans out all the nerve brain cells that 
are not productive they, and things that might cause those amyloid plaques and get in the way of clear thinking. Yes, it takes out the trash, brain cleanup. That happens during a certain deep level of sleep and seven to nine hours of sleep may be what you need. It also is a time of memory consolidation and organization. So if you think, oh, I'm forgetting my keys, I forgot this, I forgot that, my memory is just not what it used to be. How's your sleep? What is your sleep pattern? Are you looking at your phone all night? Do you put your phone next to your bed? Oh, ho, ho, ho. my friends, do not do that. Um, the, even that little light before you go to bed, don't get wild up because you won't be in restful sleep. And that's not the first thing you look at in the morning either because you need to ease into your day. One of the things that's the real um, issue is untreated sleep apnea, untreated. That can increase the risk of Alzheimer's by 70%. That's huge, untreated. Also stroke, anxiety, depression, and obesity. So sleep apnea, if you need to get a diagnosis, and that's what you need to do. If, you think, if you're not sleeping restfully, if you're waking up a lot in the night, that's your body's mechanism trying to save you. But treatment reverses the risk. I like that a lot. Treatment reverses the risk. So that is a good thing to know. But sleep apnea, they were referring to it as an epidemic. The other thing is optimize in that neuro pattern. Cognitive resilience, mental and social. In other words, we're not just the physical body. We're body, mind, emotions, our spirit. We're all of those things. And optimizing all of what you are. That's the O, optimize. Cognitive resilience. Now, there were a couple of studies, and, and I've, I've known of these for many years and bring them up in my Age with Greg's trainings when I train educators. Does anybody can raise your real hand if you've heard of the taxi driver um, study, the London taxi driver study, or the nun study? Um, those are two that are very famous. London taxi drivers and bus drivers. And what they looked at was how these taxi drivers operate as opposed to how bus drivers operate, the level of complexity. And what they found was that London taxi drivers had bigger brains, had bigger, better brains, because they had to figure out the traffic. They had to figure stuff out. They were engaged in complex problem solving to get their fare to where they were supposed to be. Whereas bus drivers just followed the route. They didn't have to think much, they just went on the route. And that is becomes a habit and the brain doesn't have to be engaged. And so it's like, eh, I don't have to work, I'm just gonna slough off. Sloughing off is a good term to use there. So that that is a very famous study. The other one, and, um, in terms of engagement and being involved is the nun study. And this group of nuns, like a thousand nuns, gave their brains to science to be studied and after they were gone and, and all of the things that went along with that. This, this is one of the older studies. But what they found was that the nuns who were when they looked at their brains and they, you know, they took their brains apart and they did all the scientific study of the brains, they found a lot of amyloid plaques, a lot of possibility for Alzheimer's and dementia in their brains, but they did not exhibit any of those characteristics in life for the ones that were engaged in the community. 
So the nuns that went out in the community who were challenged with problem solving and involved with people's lives and helping, they had a lot of possibility for Alzheimer's when they looked at their physical brain, but they didn't have Alzheimer's or dementia. And it was concluded from this study. The other ones did that didn't engage in the community that stayed in the convent. Um, they were not challenged. They were not involved in the outer world. They didn't have to use language to, you know, engage people. So that that was a big factor. That's very important. So it's essential for brain health. Your purpose, the complexity, and the challenge. Those three things. So that's your why. Purpose, the complexity of your purpose, and challenging yourself. Don't just like, um, you know, don't just retire, rewire. Take it a step further. So what's your why? Now, this has to be stated very specifically, your purpose. What do you want in your life? What specifically? Oh, I want to have a better life. Well, that is just too blah. You've got to be very specific about what you want. You can make a list. Be specific. I want to be able to get down on the floor and play with my grandchildren. I want to be able to um, not be a burden on my family because they have to take care of me because I you know, can't even pick up a fork. I can't remember where my car keys are or, or the car. So be very specific about what you want as your purpose. This is the topic for a whole nother day. It's huge. Having a purpose, a purposeful life, but being specific. The complexity of that involving multiple parts of the brain, the domains of the brain. So when we talk in Ageless Grace about the five functions of the brain, and acronym is SMAC, strategic planning, memory and recall, kinesthetic learning, analytical thinking, you know, all of that. Involving all of that is hugely important. Those domains of the brain, the more complex. Don't stay with what you know. You know it already. Do something different. Change the way you drive yourself to the post office. Change the route you go to the grocery store. When you go in the Publix, go to the other side of the Publix and start with your buggy over there. That is going to challenge your brain. That is simple. That's something you can do. Pick up your fork with your left hand if you're right dominant and feed yourself that delicious, nutritious meal from the mind diet. Brush your teeth with your non-dominant hand. So there's little simple things that you can do that can involve multiple parts of the brain. And it's not just acting on rote or automatic. Because that's where we get in trouble. Challenge yourself. Take it to the next level. Yes, I can play chopsticks on the piano. Take it to the next level. Maybe you can do chords and, oh, maybe you could end up playing Beethoven. Playing that guitar, that involves a lot of parts of the brain. And fingers here, these fingers, reading music, hearing, listening at physical activity, a lot of the brain, a lot of activity there. And then, oh yeah, well, I can just play, she'll be coming around the mountain. Well, challenge yourself, because she'll be coming around the mountain, gets pretty old pretty fast. So challenge yourself to do something different, a different language, a new language. We have all sorts of opportunities to do that from the senior center, even though we're not in the room. And this is one more reason that we need to get on that bandwagon to get the damn door open is all I can say. <laughs> I'm sorry, did I say that? Yes, I did. And I mean it. 
Don't you let those people hear me say that, Victoria. <laughs> Get the door open because we need to be with others as well to optimize our brain capacity. Don't retire, rewire. So simple, easy steps that involve nutrition, movement, sleep, and optimizing your life and your life purpose. Not some big esoteric blah, blah, but your life purpose. Now, what I want to do is open it up. Oh, by the way, I do have uh, the last slide, and I'll get this to you, Victoria. This is, um, th this, these are all links to some great YouTube videos, something that I used, and also a great one from Denise Medved in the Win Win Women's Network. Um, she just did a talk on um, brain health, and it came up on, uh, th uh, this week, this week, because it's Brain Health and Alzheimer's Awareness Month. So she's talking to um, uh, a clinical dietitian and a nutritionist. Oops, where is that going? Uh-oh, not good, Sandy. <laughs> All right, so you can tap into any of those resources. They're all available. The Center for Brain Health, the University of Texas at Dallas, every month produces some great events. Dr. Deepak Chopra, Dr. Sanjay Gupta has been on. Um, the most recent ones from this week. Um, they have a YouTube channel, and you can access any of those. I get a newsletter called the Neuroscience Newsletter. And it has lots of good stuff in it, um, and it's free, and it's neuroscience and brain health news. And then um, the YouTube video of, um, and there are other videos in Living a Graceful Life. The Win Win Women's Network is a women's network that you can get online free. So that's a possibility. All right, let's go back. All right, I want to hear from you. Uh, let's start. I'm going to get rid of uh, this, and I'll just say it, and get my big picture back so I can see you guys in full screen and see who's here. And there's Barbara, and there's Marnie, and there's, oh, Eileen, and Jackie, and oh, Marion, and okay, so. You can unmute yourself to speak, but what I want to know from you is what can you do? Give me one thing that you can do in a nutshell, make it a pearl, not a whole long, you know, necklace of talking. Um, what you can do in, in so far as nutrition, what are you going to do? What will you commit to? I want to hear your voice say it. Anybody raise your real hand. If you've got Donna. enough. Donna, go. Unmute. Unmute yourself. Oh, you're uh, you're calling on each of us. I said, oh, well, I uh, I eat a lot of vegetables, um, a lot, and uh, I think I eat pretty well. I have a little a little uh, uh, ice cream. Uh, that, that's bad. Yeah, well, that's not really bad, but. Um, there's no bad. <laughs> We're not doing a whole big diet here. We're just okay. doing little things. I eat a lot, I eat a lot of vegetables, uh, and I'm taking Italian, which is not nutrition, but it's good for my for my brain. All right. So, what vegetables? Uh, broccoli, green beans, cauliflower, uh, any green and yellow vegetables. And, all right, and they're all fresh vegetables, not from. Yeah. The yeah. All right, way to go. And the farmers markets, like I say, that's a great way to um, see people be out there, have some fun, be outdoors, walk around, and find some delicious peaches from Fort yeah. Valley. And uh, oh, maybe there's still some blueberries coming in and fresh fruits, and incorporate, you know, what you find in those farmer's markets because it's all fresh 
or you can have them delivered to you. There's, um, I know in the Tucker Farmers Market, you can order online and you can pick up. There's touchless pickup. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of possibilities if you don't want to go out to the market. Uh, it, maybe it's too hot. You can have it delivered or you can drive by and pick up. Okay, somebody else. Uh, nutrition. Marion, how about you? Are you there? I'm here. Hi. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Oh, well, I eat a lot of salad. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of salad um, and that's usually for lunch and sometimes for dinner I like salad and you know like uh, Donna said I like vegetables and fruit I like broccoli collard greens uh, green beans and cabbage those I eat a lot and right. um, I think we got those covered how about beans and legumes um, very once in a while <laughs> i do like black beans and i like pinto beans all right and but that's honestly, a great point to find them also yeah honestly i don't eat them that much <laughs> you might want to check that out and add that to your okay. salad get some garbanzo beans and throw them in your salad or throw those black beans in your salad you know they I come in that. well I off and throw them in your salad they're delicious mm -hmm. all right that's a good one how about uh anybody else got something else barbara jean bj victoria <laughs> anybody New well question. i'll say something and you know josie's on this call there are some good cooks on this call i'd like for them to speak up by the way eileen's one of them amy but, you know, I eat healthy. You know, I try very hard to eat healthy. And one of the things um, is I was listening to you is protein. We all need protein. We got to figure out a good source. And one source, of course, is beans. Garbanzo beans are very good for you. Um, but the other thing is how we prepare our food, Sandy. We all know that. We all learned how to cook or watched our mothers and grandmothers cook one way. And we now realize there's probably a healthier way to cook. And we can do that, and it, and it still tastes good. Yeah. So I'm a big fan of that. Uh, but I like in the mornings I have whole grain, actually organic seeded uh, bread toast from Trader Joe's, and I always have a bowl of either fresh strawberries or nectarines. So I do it every morning of my life because I enjoy it. But it makes me feel like I'm eating something healthy to start my day. But well, and also you can add eggs as a source of protein and you yes. could have an egg in the morning or you could have an egg in your salad. The oil that we use, Marion, when you cook those collard greens <laughs> or whatever you're cooking, extra virgin olive oil. Using that is, I, I just have started using extra virgin olive oil in cooking. It has a different heat point. You have to get used to it, but it's much healthier than some of the other uh, oils that we use. I know my grandmother used to make biscuits with lard. Oh, okay. Not be doing that. Or if you do, once every two years. <laughs> All right. So very good. How about movement? Uh, Jean, give me some something you do for in terms of movement. Oh, you're muted. Valerie, can you unmute Jean? Oh, the I, I, did, I just did. I just did it. I try to do this stand up, sit down and stand up every day. I've not been as good for a while. I did it almost religiously and I have not been as good, but I have been doing things in the yard. You know, I, um, I try to be very careful, but I love digging in the dirt and just fooling around in the yard. And I have been out a couple of times and I've sweated really good. And they say, that's good for you. And, uh, but I have to, I kind of come in the house and I kind of collapse, but I figured that's okay. Yeah, that's, that's a good way to do. Just monitor yourself, drink plenty of water, gardening and digging in the dirt that has, that has a purpose also Absolutely. not just the physical activity of doing that but but to see something bloom or come to fruition and that sense of 
of accomplishment right. is very empowering. Absolutely. Spirit. So gardening and um, you know any and and I planted some uh, I want tomato plant. I planted some lettuce in a pot and yeah. I've harvested that. Gail, I know Gail um, Christian planted some little teeny potatoes, pot potatoes. Yeah. And she didn't get a chance to eat those because they went off and but she gave them to me. So oh, they were okay. delicious. <laughs> right out of the pot. Little okay. Becky adorable potatoes. So, you know, those kinds of things um, of just moving standing up sitting down standing up sitting down absolutely yeah reaching across the table walking across the room to change the tv um those are simple things reaching down on the floor to pick something up squatting down to pick something up off the floor instead of using that grabber that i saw somebody had yeah, use those joints and muscles or come to strength and balance and we'll work on that. There are lots of ways, but don't just do those things for the exercise class. Yeah. Do them all the time. Make every movement count. You go to the bathroom. How many times do you go to the bathroom in the day? <laughs> That's stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down. Sometimes right. in the night, it may be five or six times. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> So, so that is considered movement. That's why I'm not using the term exercise, although in that acronym, that is it. So let's see, restorative sleep. Oh, brother. How many of us, uh, how many of us feel like we really have restorative sleep? I can't see your hands, but I don't know. Do you, I know Victoria's shaking her head and Donna's shaking her head. And you know what? I have lately had very sound restorative sleep. Even though I have to get up and go to the bathroom, I go right back to sleep. I don't cogitate. I don't think about, I get, I put my head down and I think, oh, I might not be able to go to sleep. And the next thing I know, it's morning. And I'm hoping that I've gotten into that REM sleep where that janitorial service can come up into my brain that's cluttered with a lot of debris, cellular debris of brain cells that I haven't used or that I no longer need and clean them out so that my memory and recall is uh, much clearer. And that my organizational skills, because there's not clutter. It's like clutter in your house. How can you get organized in your house if you have a lot of clutter? So you have to move the clutter out of the way and then you get work. This is your house. So that sleep is important and you cannot make up lost sleep with a nap. I, I heard a, a neuroscientist talk about, he was doing a neuroscientist and his research was on sleep. And he was probably in his fifties. And he said, you know, I used to pride myself on not having to have very much sleep. And I could just go, he said, but after doing this study, I realized that I was shortchanging my brain and my brain health. So if my body was in great shape and my brain was kaput because I'd stayed up late or I, you know, I could, I could research all night long and then skip the next day. He said, I learned a valuable lesson from doing this research. And he says, and I'm a neuroscientist. <laughs> okay, I'm going to pay attention to him because that's important. All right, so um, reducing stress. We need some stress. We need good stress to keep us oh, on target, to keep that quickness in our brain, the ability to respond, react, and recover, to learn new things. There's a, when you're learning something new, like you're learning to play the guitar mm -hmm. and you screw up, you have a little moment of stress, don't you? It's like, oh shoot, I messed up. But then you practice and you get better at it. So that moment of stress is not the thing that says, well, I'm just gonna give up. It's the thing that makes you move forward. It challenges you, it's good stress. And you learn how to play that piece. We do that in Ageless Grace, by the way, when we're doing counting and then 
you know, we're doing something and then, oh, and then we're going with the music. And then, you know, there are people that just don't, don't want to do it. They just, they mess up and they don't get back on the bicycle. And they just sit there. Well, their brain is just going out, taking a hike. But when you start getting that and you practice, that is empowering and it challenges your brain. It gets into a lot of parts of your brain. That's a simple little thing that we do. It's silly. Yes, it's silly. It's playful. And it's not rocket science, but it's neuroscience. And Sandy, it's Josie Crane has her hand up. Ah, uh, she does? See, I'm not looking at those hands. I said, raise your real. No, no, that's, I, just, I didn't think you were, so I just thought I would tell you. So you would know. Okay, well, let me see your face. All right, Josie. Is that Josie, right? She's Please got to unmute. Her. There she is. Okay, here we go. I'll already unmute her if she can. To know about sleep apnea. And Josie, how about you? Unmute, unmute. Sorry, unmute her if she can. I, I can't unmute. I did send a request to unmute. So you have um, to unmute yourself because I can't hear you. Your mouth is moving, but I can't hear you. <laughs> Josie, it should be in the bottom left-hand corner, that little microphone. If Look at yeah. the bottom, Josie. Oh, you just did it. There you go. On? Yeah, there you go. Oh, actually, my hand's been up since nutrition. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry, <laughs> nutrition. Tell me. I cannot believe I am the only person who has some degree of um, reflux. And mine is pretty extreme. I cannot eat raw vegetables, uh, too much roughage, any of this kind of thing. I try to eat as healthy as I can. I think this Mediterranean diet looks terrific. I love raw vegetables, salads. I can't eat them uh, without making me sick. The alternatives aren't great. You know, canned veggies, I can eat and they're better than nothing. Uh, I think, but I'm just wondering if you have any suggestions for those of us that can't eat a lot of this super duper healthy stuff. Oh, I do. I do. Um, one of the things that you might consider, of course, it doesn't have to be raw vegetables. You can, and cooking in olive oil so that the reflux, so that the, you can't handle too much fiber, you know, I, all the I, kind that you can handle. So, I'm just saying, don't make a big monumental change. That's not, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to make little changes. And you can make a little change of cooking something in that extra virgin olive oil or, or um, saute or steaming in with, I would say, check in with your primary care physician and a nutritionist. They're just focused on your reflux and giving you the medicine to keep you from having that. And right. so there are nutritionists that work with our primary care physicians. And we, Victoria probably knows somebody that we've had come. But there are plenty of things on that Mediterranean diet that you can pick and choose. Not everything. Not everything is what you're going to do. But, but pick and choose what you can do prepared in a way that is nourishing and um, delicious, attractive to eat, so it doesn't look like mush. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and because um, you, you want to eat the pretty food and, it, and nourish your physical body, your brain, and, and your spirit. If, if, I start eating things that look like baby food. It it takes me down. It's like, oh crap, I hate this. Well, and I start. <laughs> yeah, you know, I find myself eating the same stuff because I know I can eat this. It is healthy. You know, I'm doing all right. But there, I just don't have a, a lot of variety. So 
I just wanted the, those of us that have issues with certain dietary things to get a little sympathy because it's hard to eat healthy when you've got a lot of restrictions. Well, I will tell you, and, and we could take this a step further at another time, but if you Google Mediterranean diet or mind diet and reflux, you'll probably find some really good alternatives and, and maybe get some ideas that you can share with us next time. All right, yeah. let's see. Barbara had a question about sleep apnea and avoided dairy. Um, fish uh, is a good alternative. There are lots of sources of protein and vegetables, and that's what we're talking about in terms of nutrition, um, protein. Um, and then sleep apnea. Okay. Sleep apnea is um, when you are not breathing properly and you're asleep, and it, then it wakes you up. So the, the point is, you're never getting to the stage of sleep. And your heart and your body are constantly at night struggling to balance itself out. You have to go to a doctor to get a diagnosis of sleep apnea. Just waking up in the night is not necessarily a diagnosis of sleep apnea. So you do have to have that checked out and you would be involved in a sleep study where they monitor what's going on in your breathing apparatus throughout the course of a sleep cycle. Because interrupting that sleep cycle is what the danger is. And the cutting off uh, oxygenating the bloodstream and, and a lot of things go on that interfere with the um, healthy brain. So I, I can't I can't diagnose it, but go to um, I'll do the if somebody does have a sleep lab and uh, you know there's that pack that you put on your face and that that helps and you don't always have to do that. Um, but uh, it, it could save your life. It could save your brain. So, all right, let's see. Uh, we got movement. We got, how about purpose? Anybody want to take a stab at purpose before we go? Because it's time to go. Purpose. Well, uh, I, I guess, I, I don't know if I could say it's a purpose, but I have a, a neighbor who is just so helpful for me and she makes, she, she takes very good care or tries to take good care of me. And uh, I told her, I think, you know, it, it pleases me to be able to help somebody else. And, and I think that that service or maybe help and this center I will give you a testimony or testimonial or whatever you, you want to call it. But this center has been very important to me. It means an awful lot. I have met some wonderful people. You people are so good and kind and thoughtful for me. And I am damn tired of him keeping it locked up. And I don't know what else we can do. And I have suggested that maybe we could pick it or whatever, because I've write, written letters. My daughter has written letters. And our king seems to sit up there. And for whatever reason, that our center, that the taxpayers paid for, that we are not allowed to use it and participate in anything. That, and I am sick and tired of it. All right. OK, now. I know Jean has a purpose, <laughs> well. and and that is important. And we want it to be a positive, a positive purpose. And we're right. we're sick and tired of it. And I appreciate you saying that. And also the fact that we are coming together with each other. You know, volunteering, helping somebody else. Right. It's not all about you. <laughs> right. I mean, I'm just talking to everybody. You know, we think, yeah, well, it's all for me. But if but life is all those people around us that we engage with, we learn from, we share ideas with. 
Not that we always agree, but it makes us think. It makes our brain be active. It encourages us to find ways to work with people who don't think exactly like us or me. Right. To, to be creative in how we communicate with one another and actually communicating with one another. Thank God for Zoom. So I agree with you. And we have to say, you know, having your neighbor has a purpose. She's right. doing something good for herself. So right. doing something good um, specifically, you know, if you um, if you take somebody to the polls to vote. Right. That's something. So. Any number of things. If you call a neighbor on a day that it's very hot right. and you think, oh, this may not be, oh, I'm worried about them. You haven't heard from them. Give them a call. That is a purpose. You're doing good. That comes back to you a thousandfold in terms of brain health and getting out there, getting out there in the world and engaging. And Absolutely. that's one of the things I agree with you, uh, Jean, that having the center closed, whatever we can do, whether it's Zoom, whether it's being in person when we are, can be out under the porch, when it's cool enough, um, that contact, that engagement, seeing one another's faces on Zoom um, helps me. I mean, I get out in the world. I have the same feelings as everybody else. I'm just sick and tired of this. Right, Victoria? No, I'm, you know, let me support everything everybody's saying, because the one thing for me, and this is my job, but everybody knows this is the job that has kept me sane during COVID. Anybody who knows me knows I need this. But the other thing, too, I will say for me, every time we do a class outside, for me to see any of you lifts my spirits as well. And we have built a community and a camaraderie there, and we're there for each other, and we need to continue where whenever we can to say hello, to email or call or reach out to somebody, you know, or just have a, those of you that are in Claremont Crest, I know that like Donna and Joanne, some other people have formed like, like a buddy system over there, but everybody needs to have somebody that they can call and check on because the gift goes both ways. But, but we've got to get out of this isolation and we've got to be active. If you haven't seen anybody in a while, call me and say, Victoria, how's so-and-so doing? And I will ask them if you can call them. We've got to be there for each other. And we're going to get through this, Sandy. But Sandy is 100% right today. And she was in charge in case anybody didn't notice. <laughs> I, I am with you on that. And that is optimizing, optimizing your purpose. And um, it's on every level. I mean, it's, oh, you know, it's good for our spirit. It's good for our soul. That's good for your brain. What's good for your heart health is good for your brain health and vice versa. What's good for your spirit is good for your brain. And so doing what you can and, um, Having a buddy for nutrition, having a buddy for movement. Are you going to that class? Yeah, I'm going. Okay, let's go. You know, having a buddy, having somebody to engage with that will keep you and them on target is a good thing. And, um, and that just grows. That's how we got to have camaraderie and community in the first place. Remember those nuns that had all indications that they could have Alzheimer's, but they got out in the world and they were in their community and they were doing things and helping people and engaging and using language and positive energy. They didn't have Alzheimer's. They had all the plaques and all that stuff that would mess up their brain and they were okay. So I'm telling you, it's complicated. There's so much research. But all of it that I have found, all the research, and I'll just end with this, all the research that I have found, and I've looked a lot, and this is my, you know, since I'm an Exus Grace brain health educator, I've been doing this since 2011. The fact is, brain health depends on things that we can make a difference with. It's never too late to begin. 
and every little bit counts. So nutrition, movement, restorative sleep, engaging with others, and having a purpose, those are important parts. You may just do a little bit of the mind diet. You may do 10 minutes of exercise every day, every day, not just when the class is. And you will be amazed if you make those kinds of things a habit and then amp it up sometimes and challenge yourself, your brain will be more responsive. You'll be sharper. You'll have a sharper brain. I, I have no doubt about that. If you sit on your chair and do nothing and just watch the TV and binge watch and sit on the Zoom box and just watch us do exercise, I, I don't know about you. I'm just saying. I don't know about you. Yeah. Okay. That's it for me. I will get Victoria that bibliography. Thank you for hanging with me. I know you've got lots of questions and comments and things. If you do, Email Victoria <laughs> and she'll send them, she'll collect them all and she'll send that to me and I'll try to answer in a coherent way or give you where you can look because you really can find a lot of information that's valid, that's done, uh, that's based on clinical research and some of it is actually understandable by the lay person. <laughs> Which I'll is be it. glad to do that, Sandy. And thank you so much for reminding me that this is Alzheimer's Awareness Month. I had I wasn't tuned into that, and this was an excellent okay. program. Well, you know, the longest day, and for people who have Alzheimer's, the days are very long. Yeah. yeah. All, well, right. all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everybody. Thank you for a great thank class. You. Here. I'll see you. Good, good job, Sandy. Yay. I'll see you on the Zoom box. Thank nice you. to see some faces here. Oh, there's Peggy. Yeah, and there's a oh, bye. 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 Bye, Marion. Later. Thank you. Bye. Happy, healthy brain. All right. Bye.